evening session. Um, we've got a very interesting session this evening. It's Dentistry's Great Awakening, but um, I think our guest is going to talk a bit about sleep as well. Um, I'd like to welcome our guest and our panelists. We have um, our guest who's, doctor, uh, who's Mr. Roger Price, and we have our panelist is um, Dr. Dietmar Eikhoff. We have uh, Dr. Faisal Mansour and our technical team, um, Marilis. Uh, warm welcome again. I hope everybody's well. I hope your practice are running well. I hope, I think you're all well settled into this year. And uh, thank you for all your support. Um, with with our with our webinars and um, please continue supporting us and educating yourselves and learning some more. Um, before I introduce um, uh, our guests and our panelists, um, just just a few announcements that I would like to to make. So today's session will be um, CPD credited, and um, you can get your points or your certificates via. The, the SADA website and via your portal, you can create your own profile via the website. Um, this uh, tonight's session will also be live streamed on YouTube. So if you would like to view it on YouTube at the later stage or um, you know refer some of your friends to it at the later stage, you're more than welcome to find it on the SADA's YouTube channel. Um, we do have some some more CPD events planned as well. And um, on the 23rd of February, we've got a Strauman group who's been talking about implant failure and can we prevent it? And then on the 25th, we've talking about more about some economics and the macro impact of the budget speech. So those are some of the webinars that are planned for the rest of the month. Um, there will be a poll in between, so you may answer that. And then maybe at the end of the session, there will be um, a review. If you may please just uh, be kind enough to fill it at the end. It really helps us in assessing the quality and how we can improve. So with, uh, if we will also have a question and answer session at the end of, uh, at the, end of the session. So please, uh, during the session, avoid using the raise hand option, but rather just um, type your, your questions in the Q&A uh, section at the bottom, and then we'll have the, um, the question and answer session to, at the end of, um, of the presentation. So I'd just like to welcome uh, Dr. Dietmar Eikhoff, and who will introduce our guest for this evening. Uh, Dr. Good evening, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Vishal. Good evening, colleagues. It's just wonderful to be with you this evening. Um, I'm going to introduce Roger by just um, going through an introduction and then um, uh, hand you over to Roger straight away. I'll start by saying in 2020, the world changed forever and dentistry as a profession is changing forever. The world is currently facing a global healthcare crisis not only in how to deal with infectious diseases like COVID-19, but also in how to deal with non-transmissible non conditions such as breathing and sleep-related disorders on a structural and functional level. It is estimated that well over a billion people of all ages, genders, children and adults alike are suffering from airway dysfunction and sleep-related disorders, with the majority going undiagnosed. Sadly, the healthcare system is not willing to or is doing very little to address the prevention and intervention on a structural and functional level of these far-reaching and debilitating airway and sleep-related disorders. The solution to the future of healthcare is linked to a multidisciplinary education which provides healthcare practitioners with new knowledge and the skills necessary to expanding their existing careers or beginning new ones. The purpose of tonight's presentation by Roger is aimed at providing information and knowledge of normal breathing, breathing dysfunction, and the role that we as properly trained providers have a valuable role to play. Roger will explain why the current way of managing airway has failed, how there is no visible path in the immediate future to address this failure, and how we, 
as health professionals coming from a multifaceted background, not just clinical dentistry, are far better placed to address this pandemic. The current structure of the medical system precludes them from being able to turn their battleship around. Current research is now supporting and validating the long held view that functional breathing is core to the growth and development of human beings. And that as a dental profession, we have a very valuable role to contribute in this arena. The secret of success for us as a profession lies in whether we are prepared to responsibly embrace and be part of the change. But, and this is the kicker, in order to do so, we need to firstly be appropriately educated and build the skill set and expertise needed to treat our patients. Not just as a mouth with teeth in it, but also to educate and work <clears throat> with and amongst one another and allied health care professionals and patients to enable us to treat our patients as a complete human being. As Hans and Enlo in their book, Essentials of Facial Growth, published in 2018, second edition, <clears throat> in chapter one, page 13 stated, if there develops any child, any regional childhood variation along the course of the airway, that significantly alters its configuration or size, in other words, its shape or size. Growth then proceeds along a different course, leading to a variation in overall facial assembly that may exceed the bounds of normal pattern. The airway functions in a real sense as a keystone for the face. To take this one step further on page 472, they stated the oral jaw musculature oral jaw musculature is responsible for the vital positional relationships that maintain the oral pharyngeal airway. The axial mus musculature around the vertebrae is also involved. These primitive neonatal protective, protective mechanisms provide the motor background upon which with growth, all the postural mechanisms of the head and neck region are developed. Physiological maintenance of the airway is of vital continuing importance from the first day throughout life. This, colleagues, is why we have Roger presenting this evening. Roger is not a dentist, but as a respiratory physiologist, he saw the link between breathing and the role of dentists 20 years ago and has dedicated a large part of his life since then, studying into the promoting functional breathing and the valuable role which dentists and related dental disciplines are able to play. I give you my friend, Roger Price. Over to you, Roger. Well, thank you, Dietmar. I mean, there's not much more to say after that introduction. Nanda ma, so bona. Jumela, hartelijke welkom. And thank you to all involved with this very worthwhile project. Most specifically to my friends, Dietmar Eikhoff and Faisal Mansour, who honored me with the request to deliver the keynote address for this program. The format will be simple. I'll do a short introduction as to how I became involved what I've discovered in the 20 plus years in which I've been working, not only in Australia, but in the US and in many other countries around the world, with literally thousands of dentists, orthodontists, and other ists. I'll then discuss where the medical sleep industry is at today, what is projected to the future, and to explain how these projections, to my mind at least, will not make one jot of difference to the dismal outcomes currently being experienced. The reason for that bold and bleak statement is very simple. The problem is being addressed This is all going to be explained as we go along. So please feel free to pose questions, which I will attempt to answer at the end. I'll stop them into chat and the moderator will check them and go through them in the order in which they were received. So it's time to buckle up those seat belts. And let's go on this roller coaster ride, which will probably turn a lot of your preconceived notions on their heads. So time for me to share my screen. 
and pick up life as it is today in the beautiful city of Sydney, Australia. So this is going to be sunrise shortly over my balcony, heralding another beautiful day and a perfect summer's day in Sydney. And one of the most beautiful cities in the world. The topic is going to be centered around breathing disordered sleep. And breathing disordered sleep is just exactly what I say it is. It's, it's a rapidly evolving connection between disrupted sleep and the sleep professional. So what we want to do here is, I didn't say the dentist, I didn't say the orthodontist, I didn't say the periodontist or the prosthodontist, because I'm referring to the dental profession as a profession, not as a group of clinical services. Because you guys are so experienced in so many other aspects of, of health and well-being. What you're doing is just a tip of the iceberg. And dentistry today, the dental profession today, is hopelessly, horribly, and terribly undervalued and underutilized. And as Ditz mentioned earlier, we, we have a pandemic here. This is, this is far greater than COVID. This whole thing is just a t total disaster. So it's wonderful to be back to the country in which I was born a very long time ago. It was a long time ago. And we're going to take it from here and discuss a number of things. Dentistry's Great Awakening, 2021. We're going to have a quick look at my journey which has taken me 63 years since I graduated from Rhodes University in 1960. 60 years of experience in education and training and study in a lot of fields. There's a lot of stuff there in 60 odd years, I can tell you. But it's for a very good reason. Because they're all linked. All of these things are interlinked. And that is why it's just been an evolution. I've also had the privilege and the honor to lecture for some of the probably largest leading training and education groups in the world. And I've got involved in an area called functionalism. I was honored in 2016 to be presented with a lifetime award for the contributions towards functionalism. So, of course, the content of this keynote address is purely for information and educational purposes. The information contained comes from reputable and reliable sources and does not advocate any modality or treatment. In the absence of valid clinical trials, evidence-based medicine is used to provide explanations. So first and foremost, what is a keynote address? It's an address designed to present the issues of primary interest to an assembly and often to arouse unity and enthusiasm. I think it's very important for us to note this unity and enthusiasm because sadly, there are many divisions in the world of medicine and dentistry and that doesn't do anybody any favors, most particularly our patients. So I have a dream, and I say it softly and quite quickly because it didn't do Martin Luther King much good. And the dream is to create a new specialty. This is a specialty for dentists and orthodontists and prosthodontists and periodontists and pedodontists, which will fill the current void left by the lack of knowledge and education in that vital field of human behavior which is the driver of dysfunction. And there'll be more about this as we go along. So I'm just going to switch camera here to make it a little more comfortable. Just one second, okay. Keynote lectures don't teach anything. That's not their role. They provide a framework for what is it to come so that you know in advance what to expect. 
keynote speakers are usually very old and very gray with lots of hair and beard and very, very wise. I think the only category that I feel here is being very old. And this is what a keynote used to be like. Oh, those were the days I can tell you. 500 dentists from all over the world. This is the Coise Education Center in Seattle in the United States. Five days of the most incredible interaction. And who knows if these days will ever come back again. So this is what Keynote is today. And we're separated by distance, but certainly not by passion. And when COVID is up, I tell you, I'm going to be on the first plane back to South Africa to come and meet as many of you as possible. This has been a fascinating journey. It started in Australia and has taken me literally all over the world. The United States coast to coast and in the middle, the whole of Canada, the northern wilds of Canada, where it's so cold in the morning, you find a dog stuck to the tree. It's taken me to Europe, to Italy, Spain, Portugal, France, Hungary, Czech Republic, into Russia, into Armenia, into uh, Ukraine, to places like Cuba and the Caribbean and Mexico and Central America and South America. And of course, South Africa. And this is how it all began. So in 1999, I was teaching asthmatics using the Buteyko principles here in Australia. And I met a guy called John Flutter in Queensland. He was working almost exclusively with children. And he asked me whether I thought that there was a connection between breathing and malocclusion. Well, that kind of sparked an interest for one simple reason. It sounded a little far-fetched. But in the dim, distant past, I had personal experience. I had brought up a blended family of five children, four of whom who needed orthodontics. Incidentally, the four with problems were all C-section. I had no knowledge or interest in this in the 70s and 80s. I was told teeth grow crooked and need to be straightened, which is what we did. And believe me, there were some crooked teeth that needed some straightening. It was a long, drawn out, expensive process. Ten years with multiple lost retainers and one silver rolls royce later, the orthodontist informed me the job was done. But it was not that simple. All four of them have suffered relapses and have airway issues of varying kinds to varying degrees of severity. And they are all now in their late 40s, early 50s. I am not saying that the orthodontist caused the airway problem. Please, let me be very, very clear about this. These children were all compromised when I took them to see him. But what he did did not help. In fact, he made it worse. Unwittingly, unknowingly, uh, following best practice guidelines, he actually made it worse. And remember what he said, do you remember? Firstly, do no harm, Hippocrates. So he was not guilty, but it doesn't mean he was innocent. And the percentage of people today who have these sleep-related breathing disorders and this disrupted sleep issue, the percentage of those people who have had inappropriate teeth removed and bimax retrusion and retraction orthodontics and headgear and that, that percentage is extremely high. So the important thing here is that the more I dug into my 40-year-old anatomy and physiology books, the answer literally jumped out at me. It was one of those eureka moments where I realized this has nothing to do with sleep. It's all about interrupted breathing. And at the same time, the father of one of the kids we were working with mentioned that he was using a CPAP machine. And that was impossible to get used to it. It was, it was literally killing him. 
He said his AHI was only six, but the doctor told him he needed it. He was a chronic mouth breather with dry, cracked lips. And it was then that I made the connection between the mouth breathing, the low CO2 and central apnea, something that many, many in the medical profession today still do not understand. And that is another topic which we will talk about at another time. So the net widened and I met John and Mike Mew. This is going back 20 years and we have become close and very dear friends. At the same time, Patrick McKeon in Ireland uh, became quite interested in what was going on in the, in the dental sleep field. And he wrote a book, Buteco meets Dr. Mew and the rest is history. Then in 2008, I brought Sandra Coulson out to Sydney to run the first ever orofacial myology training course in Australia. And this was held in my clinic in Sydney. And gee, guess who was there in all his sartorial glory is again, John Flutter. One of the very first Australian dentists to become an orofacial myologist. Sarah Hornsby, whom you'll be meeting and hearing from later on, was another one of the trainees. And she went and upped her skills enormously. Then I met Steve Almos, right about the same time in 2008. And then when I moved to the United States, <clears throat> we had a number of interactions. And I presented at several of his meetings across the country. And you will get to meet Steve as well. And he is a firm believer that breathing is the driver rather than sleep. And he is a very generous guy and I consult for two of his Sydney-based clinics on a regular basis. And he very kindly wrote this. He said, I thoroughly enjoyed your demystifying the airway e course. You are a wonderful instructor. Gee guys, that coming from Steve Almos is praise indeed, I can tell you. I will share your website courses with my centers and at my courses. I really like what you've done. Best wishes, Stephen. Now we come to the South African link. Through John Flutter, I met Dittmar in Brisbane when he was visiting Australia back in 2008. He then returned and came to spend 10 days with me in Sydney on Bondi Beach. I want to tell you, he didn't look in the room much. He was looking outside at the bikinis on the beach. And then in 2010, I visited South Africa and we toured the country together, educating groups of dentists. I came back again in 2019 when I met Faisal. So that kind of wraps up the circuit. So what is the goal? If you don't know where you're going, you'll never know when you get there. The goal is maximum outcome with minimum intervention. We want to create something which is totally foreign to the disease management model of the Western world. We want a concerted interdisciplinary approach to complex conditions where the symptoms are not the sole focus and where equal attention is paid to the cause, not just the intervention. So ask a person what the problem is, and they're going to tell you their symptoms. Symptoms are rarely the same as the problems that cause them. Okay, if you've got a compound fracture of the arm and you say, in our, my arm is sore, the symptoms and, you know, and the problem are the same. But what happens when you have subtleties? What happens if there are things that you don't know that you don't know? Very often, the person who is treating the symptoms is not sufficiently qualified or educated to isolate and address the actual problem. This is an orofacial muscular problem, which is developed into an occlusal problem, which perpetuates the orofacial problem. So we have to bear all of these things in mind. So to find out more, we have to ask five critical questions. I call them the five WH questions. The key one, of course, is what is the problem? Not what are the symptoms? Why did it happen? Not just accepting that it happened. 
I'd had the orthodontist tell me, oh, teeth grow crooked. And I accepted it, no more. When did it happen? Is it recent? Or is it of long duration? Where do we start in order to address the etiology? And you know, guys, this is so important. Who is the appropriate practitioner to address the prime issue? Not necessarily the symptoms. Only then can we look at the how. At the moment, Western medicine and dentistry is all focused on how. How do I fix this? What do I prescribe? What do I do? What do I implant? How do I image? We need to find out what and why first. This is what we call healthcare. So for this, we need a health village. And it's mentioned it early on in the introduction. We need a team of people who can ask, answer, and also address the five WH questions. To quote the words of one of my very dear and most respected friends and colleagues, Dr. John Coyce, all of us know more than any of us. So let's have a look and see why the current medical system simply cannot handle this problem. The reasons are simple. It is over-regulated by Medicare and insurance with a strong input from lawyers, with litigation, with malpractice. There's limited time for consultation. It's in and out here in Australia at 7.38 minutes beginning to end for a consultation. It operates in isolation. It is the doctor behind the desk. There's no team. The role is to quickly diagnose, prescribe and refer. There is no time to identify the cause. You've got a waiting room full of people there. It uses the across the desk approach where my job is to fix you. This is disease management. This is not healthcare. The dental setting is much better suited to this. What we're talking about is primarily a behavior disorder. We're looking at dysfunction, not disease. Dentist teams are in a better position to identify and educate because behavioral change is a team effort. It's not a solo effort of writing prescription. This, my friends, is healthcare. This is not disease management. We need early awareness. We need to be able to interact with our patients and, and our, our friends and our family to educate them what to look for. The open mouth could be a warning sign. If this child continues to push on one side, he is going to develop postural imbalances. There is no question, there is no doubt in my mind that this, the, the heavy school bag on the one shoulder, these are the starting points of scoliosis and the other spinal deformations, which are not genetic. They are nurture, they are not nature. These are the epigenetic, epigenetic things that, that cause the shift from the genotype to the phenotype. And this requires a homely, friendly environment rather than a stern medical office. We have to look for the canaries in the coal mine. This is a typical scene on a Sunday morning on Bondi Beach. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of children with parents and coaches at this training. Amongst those parents were doctors and nurses and dentists and physiotherapists. Did anybody notice or comment on this group? Four cute little girls. Three out of four children between the ages of five and 12 have crooked teeth. What you are seeing is all too commonplace to the point that it is now considered as being normal. This is anything but normal. So the current situation is that nearly 1 billion people worldwide have sleep apnea. This came from the International Sleep Conference by ResMed at the American Thoracic Society in 2018 in San Diego. It indicates that the prevalence is nearly 10 times greater than previous estimates. This is somewhat a scandal. 
And it's getting worse. It's not getting better. Despite spending billions of dollars, the problem is getting worse. There are no valid scientific metrics to address this issue. But there is a solution. And I've been involved in that solution for over 20 years. And this solution is evidence-based medicine. But it is not accepted nor implemented. So in perspective, if you look at those billion sufferers and you see that less than 10% are diagnosed, less than 50% of those are compliant. Treating only the numbers is what they're doing. They're not treating the patient. There has been no change to the principle of positive airway pressure in 45 years. Oral appliances reposition the mandible. They don't fix the problem. So we're sitting here with a fundamentally flawed concept. The concept that sleep disorders breathing is incorrect. Functional daytime breathing will translate to functional nighttime breathing. Sleep is not the problem. People wake up because they can't breathe, not because they can't sleep. And you know, the contradictory thing here is that the two gold standards, CPAP and oral appliance therapy, are not sleep therapies. They are breathing interventions that have nothing to do with the process of sleep. So there is a simple solution. It requires a 180 degree turnaround. We have to think breathing disordered sleep as the problem. And I came up with this term 20 years ago, and it's caused a couple of raised eyebrows, I can tell you. We have to address the issue at its source and identify and treat dysfunctional daytime behavior. We want to pay more attention to the patient attached to the symptoms than to the symptoms attached to the patient. And this is not compatible with the existing medical model as we saw a couple of slides ago. Sleep disordered breathing just does not make sense. The only time that the process of sleep would disorder breathing would be if the breathing was dysfunctional to begin with. Otherwise, nobody would ever sleep. Healthy people would go down, go to sleep, and then the sleep would disorder their breathing. Guys, it doesn't make sense. Given that we're awake for two thirds of our lives and trying to recover for one third, to me, it made perfect sense that the dysfunction was caused during the day and aggravated at night when it was manifest. So all of this has caused upper airway resistance. This too much air per breath, too many breaths per minute, in and out through the mouth, over those cracked lips, irritating mucosal tissues. It's the congestion that's causing the obstruction. But this is reversible. This is not understood at all by the medical or dental profession, which is looking for hard facts. Notwithstanding this, many ENTs are prescribing steroids as part of their protocols. They're saying the tissues are inflamed, the mucosa is inflamed, uh, take some steroids to calm down the inflammation. They're not saying, why are these tissues inflamed? I'm sorry, it's Mr. Just... Price. Sorry, yes. can I interrupt? There's a lot of background noise coming. So um, maybe if you can just... Make I wonder, because it's dead quiet here. Maybe it's... just come closer to your screen and... Five o'clock in the morning. Yeah, Hang on. Let me change microphones. Let me just switch them. What's it like now? Is it better? 
Um, yes, you can continue if okay. there is. I'm going to have to unshare for the moment and then just change microphones. Okay, I think it, microphone. it is sounding much better. Do you have audio now? We have audio, but uh, you can just uh, continue okay, to share. Okay, so let's it. just change the settings here. And let's go on to the external speaker. And maybe that's going to solve the problem. Perhaps, yeah. Is that better? Yes, sounds, sounds much better. All righty. So let me clip this on here. It's surprising that should happen because it's well, it's five o'clock in the morning, so there's there's no surrounding noise at all. It's, so let's go back to the show. It's more of a crackling microphone type of sound. So maybe now that you've changed the microphone, it should be better. But maybe okay. maybe continue, and um, I'll let you know if there is. If there... All right. So let me go back. I just have to pick this up again. Okay, do we have the image again? Yes, yes, the screen is being shared. And is the sound better now? Yes, seems 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 to be much better. All right, let's carry on. Yammer man, sir, I don't know why that happened. You know what it probably was? It might have been that it was a headset mic and it was rubbing against my shirt. Perhaps. All righty. So let's carry on. Thank you so much. So I've been tilting at windmills and I've been accused of being dyslexic because it's sleep disordered breathing not breathing disordered sleep what's the matter with you what's your problem and you know I've got a thick skin and I just carried on like Don Quixote tilting at these windmills and one by one I found people who were receptive to this heretical thought and in 2012 I decided to relocate to the United States so I packed 72 years of life into two suitcases and off I went. I had zero idea as to what I was going to do or where I was going to do it. And I ended up with an old friend of mine, Dr. Barry Rayfield, whom I'd met earlier on and he'd implemented my protocols into his very progressive practice in Clifton in New Jersey. And Barry generously offered me a permanent home. And we spent four incredible years together in New Jersey. In fact, I was 30 minutes outside of Manhattan. I learned all about orthodontics from Barry and he's a great teacher. And I tell you, I'm quite a good diagnostician. I wouldn't know what a bracket looked like, but after working with him for four years, I could see the structure. I could see the dentofacial and the craniofacial abnormalities. And of course, in my career, I had done a lot of body work as well and cranial work and all kinds of things. So it really was quite a nice mix. I then completed my ICAT training together with him when we put in the first ICAT iFlex. So he had a beautiful setup, four and a half thousand square feet. Sorry, the Mr. dental Clayton, office is on. Can I interrupt? Pardon? Apologies to interrupt again. Um, would you yes. change your presenter view so that we can see your slides bigger? At the moment, we're seeing the present your notes as well. So maybe, yeah. Oh, yammer, yammer. Um, then I will stop share and then I will go into play mode. Share screen. Let's bring it up again. Um, let me take this down. You see, it's showing full screen my side. I can't understand why it's doing this. Um, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it down and I'm going to put it into play. How's that now? Um, you, I think you'll have to just share your screen. Just one sec. Uh, now we have to share screen again. Let's go back to Zoom. To err is human, to screw it up, you need a computer. Right? How about now? Have we got full screen? 
Not yet, no. It's still showing. Okay, so we'll go stop share. We'll go back again. We'll pick it up again. We'll share screen. We'll pick up the image. Okay, let me take that down. Let me take that away. Share screen. Start outline. Now we have to go back again. Let me put it up. Okay, let's get out of it. Back to Zoom, back to share screen. What about now? Perfect, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. It's just one of these technical glitches that, that happens to jump in. So it's a large center, it's 4,500 square feet. And we opened an integrative education center, which is still there. Um, some of you might know these two, that's Barry and the purple shirt. Uh, on his left is Ayal Botser from Tel Aviv in Israel. He's the tongue tie expert. And on the other side next to me is Gabor, Gabor Herman from Budapest. Uh, he's an orthodontist, a very progressive one as well. And we ran so many courses over those years in so many disciplines. We trained literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people through that center. It also became the East Coast Myobrace facility. So there was plenty of activity and interaction all the way around. So we have to face facts. The system is broken. It's broken because it's primarily a bottom line, money focused disease management business. And believe me, it's not worldwide. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of the, the statistic, but only 16% of the world's population of people use Western medicine. The other 84%, uh, who do we have? We have India with Ayurveda. We have China with traditional Chinese medicine. We've got Japan. We've got all the other nations who use traditional medicine. Western medicine takes up a large part of our lives but not on a worldwide basis. It's built on the premise of disease management and not health creation. It's too controlled by government, health insurance and lawyers. It is prohibitively expensive. I've been in practice for over 60 years. I remember what it was like 60 years ago. It was simple. Doctors drove Morris thousands. They didn't drive Maseratis. We didn't have all this technology and we've out technologicized ourselves. And because everybody is so afraid of malpractice and being sued, everybody is ordering more tests and doing more imaging than they really need to do just in case. It's a slave to technology and research is untrustworthy. And I know that that's a big claim to make and I'm going to back it up. Many claims in research are simply not true. <clears throat> and even after practices have been debunked, they are still used. Here is a slide that comes from the Mayo Clinic. It shows a decade of reversal with an analysis of 146 contradicted medical practices these are things that were gold standard. These were things that you could bank. These were things that you were told, we have the research. And although there's weak evidence base for some practice, it gains acceptance largely through vocal support from these prominent advocates and faith that the mechanism of action is sound. And later on, future trials undermine the therapy but removing the contradicted practice is so often so challenging. Mammograms, hormone replacement therapy, the prostate specific antigen for prostate cancer, 
stents, the apnea hypopnea index, the diagnosis of asthma, the benefit of myrongotomies, arthroscopic knee surgery, C-reactive protein testing, BIS monitors for anesthesia. These things have all been debunked. So let's go and talk to our two friends in 1975, Bill Dement and Christian Gimeno. They jointly created the concept of OSAS, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. They came up over a couple of beers with the apnea hypopnea index, the AHI. Both acknowledged that the AHI was flawed in its concept because there were arbitrary measurements. They said, what is an apnea? And one said, um, what about cessation of breathing for 10 seconds? Yeah, okay. What about nine seconds? What about 11 seconds? And then the question came, what, what is a hypopnea? Well, it's not a full apnea. So how much of an apnea is hypopnea? Yeah. Uh, uh, what about 50%? Some labs use 50, some use 30, some use 60. There is no standard which remains the standard. It has no scientific validity. And there is continuing disquiet and confusion regarding diagnoses and symptoms of the gold standards. And this all came under question. More professionals were challenging the AHI the European Journal of Sleep Research investigated the science behind the AHI. And I'm not gonna read the whole thing. I'll give you the link if you want it, but right at the bottom it says, a critical appraisal of the extensive literature shows that both assumptions are invalid. This conclusion prompts a reconsideration of the role of the apnea hypopnea index as the prime diagnostic metric of clinically relevant obstructive sleep apnea. It's not valid, but you know there's no alternative standard. So it's still being used as the standard. The excuse is there's nothing else. We don't have anything else. We're gonna talk about the AHI. Okay, don't get me wrong. The AHI is useful to indicate change. If your first AHI is, is 96 and your second is 15, we know that there's a change, but it misses more than it picks up. And you know, maybe it was invalid from the start. Then comes the question of evidence-based medicine. I mean, this has become totally and utterly prostituted in terms of its understanding. In truth, it is the intersection of three individual processes. It's the clinician's skill and experience and the expertise. It's the patient satisfaction and the success of the outcome. And it's the best available published research. Where these three things intersect, that is evidence-based medicine. It's being dismissed as lacking any scientific validation because the medical community is focused on the purple ring. EBM is all about research. No, my friends, it is not. It is all about skill. It is all about observation. It is all about anecdotal reporting. It is all about outcome. So these four accepted diagnostics, diagnostic metrics are inaccurate. The AHI is debunked as being invalid. The BMI was never intended to be an individual metric, and we'll cover that in a moment. Evidence-based medicine has been perverted to mean research. And sleep-disordered breathing is a grab bag classification for any form of disrupted sleep. So with these TLAs, which are three-letter abbreviations, we've actually messed the entire system. Look at the BMI. It was explicitly stated this should not be used as an individual metric. It was designed as a population marker based on a 200-year-old numerical hack developed by Adolf Quetelet, who was a Belgian statistician. But you see, because it's a three-letter abbreviation and it's a single number between one and 100 that comes from a mathematical formula, 
It carries an air of scientific authority. It is mathematical snake oil. But yes, again, it is useful to indicate change. It's not useful as a diagnostic measure. So look at the formula. Nothing like these three letter abbreviations. AHI plus BMI equals SDB. No, it doesn't. The conclusions are erroneous, but they continue to be promulgated and perpetuated until they take on a life of their own. It is primarily not a sleep issue. <clears throat> so we keep on getting asked. I mean, I must have been asked thousands of times, where are the clinical trials? There is this fanatical compulsion <clears throat> not to believe anything unless it's been randomized, controlled, double-blinded, placebo-verified, peer-reviewed, Cochrane-validated, meta-analyzed. No trials? What do you mean there are no trials? That's ridiculous. How can this thing ever work if there are no trials? Well, and this comes from Mayo Clinic again. Recently, a project of the BMJ titled Clinical Evidence 81 completed a review of 3,000 medical practices, not doctor's offices, medical procedures. <clears throat> it found that slightly more than one third are effective or likely to be effective. 15% are harmful or unlikely to be beneficial or a trade-off between benefits and harms. And 50% are of unknown effectiveness. Investigation complements these data and suggests that a high percentage of all practices may ultimately be found to have no net benefits. Is it really that black and white? Is the absence of evidence, evidence of absence? Does the lack of proof invalidate evidence? Does the existence of a paper prove validity? Are we not better off being roughly right than precisely wrong? And for those of you who are involved with sleep studies, look at the last page of every sleep study. Are the comments not almost exactly the same? A trial of CPAP is recommended for a week or two at a water pressure of 10 centimeters, blah, 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 and lose some weight and turn on your side and get another pillow. It's whistling in the dark, and you'll see that this, as we progress, becomes worse and worse. We have a challenge. Sisyphus had it easy. All he had to contend with was a rock. We have this amorphous mass of ego and dogma that we have to overcome. Best practice is now being challenged. And of course, everybody is resisting change. We don't want change. There's legal risk in admitting mistakes of the past. Academia pr protects ingrained positions and dogma. I spent two years as an academic in a university in Queensland, and everybody defers to these clinical trials as though they're the be all and end all of everything. There is a resistance to anything that is regarded as not being proper research. It ignores the tenets of evidence-based medicine. And this is what I call FOGMA, which is the confused state of actually seeing results after having stated repeatedly that these results are just not possible. So my friends, we have a problem. And the problem is a modern, acquired syndrome, which is known as CRS. What does CRS stand for? Craniorectal syndrome is a syndrome that affects the large majority of medical and dental institutions and practitioners, those who adhere to dogma and past knowledge and refuse to acknowledge that the world is in fact round. They steadfastly dismiss as irrelevant anything that does not accord with their own narrow world and thinking. See also ego. This is how they spend their lives. 
And if this is their constant position, is it any wonder they don't see the light? They make assumptions and assumptions are dangerous. Things are not always what they seem to be at first. We tend to form our first impressions and then look for confirmation, confirmation bias. Sometimes we simply get it wrong. Yeah, that's a martini glass. So the reality is two thirds of life is awake and surviving. One third is attempting to recover. Sleep is a normal physiological function. It is not a disease that requires medical intervention. It is the diseases of disrupted sleep that need medical attention. And this is where a highly complex discipline, such as our medical system, is required. Sleep and airway are interlinked. So here you see three very powerful people. They are saying there is too much focus on testing. They are saying that treating the data and the numbers is not treating the patient. What percentage of patients are seen by the person who is reading the sleep data and making the diagnosis? It is minuscule. There is very, very poor compliance. There is a lack of interest in treating to success. Something has to change. So I'm going to ask Marlies here, please, to play a video. It doesn't work. For some reason, the audio doesn't work when it's embedded. And she's going to play this. This is two minutes and seven seconds. And I'll put my timer on. And I'll come back to you after you watch this, which is very telling. And please watch it very carefully. Off you go. Mr. Price, we don't see the, the video playing. Is it not coming through? No, it's, it's not playing. Okay, so let me just preempt this whole thing and tell you what it is. It's a two minute story by Dr. Barbara Phillips, who is the head of critical care at the University of Kentucky. And okay, something has happened here. There we go. It actually is a public health problem of some magnitude. The diagnosis and the management of sleep apnea to this point has been, in my view, too complicated, too time consuming, too expensive, too patient unfriendly, too test oriented, and not nearly enough follow up chronic management oriented. That is changing. It has to change. There is a professional organization that continues to insist that physicians who are board certified in sleep medicine be reimbursed for reading the sleep studies, which is where the money has traditionally been, and which I can tell you is not rocket science. The management, actually, the follow-up, the actual care of the patients has just been sort of willy-nilly, slipshod, not necessarily done uh, by people who even understand uh, what a sleep study means. As a result, the vast majority of people with sleep apnea remain undiagnosed. They don't want to bother with all this expensive testing, or maybe they have the test, but they never even get any follow-up. And many people who are prescribed effective treatment don't use it, again, because chronic use of any treatment requires ongoing encouragement, education, follow-up adjustment, and care, which has really not been a huge focus of prof professional organizations, which seem to be a little bit more focused on testing than on actually taking care of patients. Okay, so now we want to share screen again. And that has to come up to this one.
Okay, are we all back live? Um, will you just, uh, Mr. Price, will you just change your presenter view? Okay, so we're back on the old one. Yes. Let me just take it off. Let me stop share. Let me go to presenter view, share screen. Has it gone full screen now? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so the YouTube link is there. If you want to listen to this, just Google Dr. Barbara Phillips YouTube and you'll come up with this interview. This is very telling because this is a very, very, very highly experienced woman. So we have this tyranny of testing. When the diagnosis is not obvious, the test can be inaccurate. You have to have a sleep study. You have to measure a normal night's sleep. It's not possible for this to be a normal night's sleep. How accurate can the results be? A side sleeper becomes a back sleeper. The room is dark. The room is bright. There's no intrusion. There's monitoring. There's comfortable sleepwear. There's cables and effort bands. It's a home environment versus a clinical environment. It all ends up being about the numbers. So the second person that I showed you there is Dr. Eileen Rosen, who is the president, who was the president of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. The last paragraph is the most important. The overall success rate and compliance with treatment is low, and the outcomes less than favorable. The reason given is the excessive focus on testing, and very little is being done in actual treatment of the problem. We're hampered by research. It's hindering process. It's doing all kinds of things that it should not be doing. There's no alternative approach. The focus is still on intervention after the event. The existing metrics are still being used and they're being defended in the face of being shot down. Not everything can be trialed using the same approach. So research has come under the gun. There is no single research protocol. We're too complex to compare. Research validity is just suspect. Richard Horton, the editor-in-chief of The Lancet said, much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, may simply be untrue. Afflicted by studies with small sample sizes, et cetera, et cetera. He said, science has taken a turn towards the darkness. John Ioannidis, who is very much to the fore with COVID, he is one of the leading researchers. He says, there is increasing concern that most current published research findings are false. He goes on to say a whole lot of things, all about sample size, etc. But the principle is, this is false. We talk about Cochrane. Cochrane used to be, it was just, it was the the be all and end all, it was the world's most prestigious scientific journal. One of its highest profile board members was sacked because he protested against the commercialization of Cochrane. They wanted to take money for comments. This is where transparency is going. So here are a couple of quick comments from the leaders in the United States. Richard Bogan is the medical director of SleepMed, chief medical officer of SleepMed, clinical professor of University of South Carolina, associate clinical professor at Medical University. In an interview with Sleep Diagnosis and Therapy Journal, the topic was excessive daytime sleepiness. This is November 2018. In thinking about this, the important message is for us to recognize individuals have some sort of impairment beyond the medical risk. Fantastic. He is seeing beyond the machine. However, there are FDA approved drugs. There are drugs approved to treat persistent EDS in patients. There are some drugs that have been recently studied. We must have our eyes wide open for drugs, drugs now and in the future that can address the issue of persistent EDS. It's all about the drugs. This is all about the intervention. This is not to do with the prevention. Then of course we have National Sleep Foundation, July 28th, not even a year ago. <clears throat> the head is Dr. David White. He is a Harvard medical professor. 
He's a former president of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. He is the CMO of a major manufacturer of sleep treatments, $2 billion a year in treatments. Look what he says. If the physician could determine exactly why each patient has OSA, therapy could be directed at the specific abnormality of abnormalities. Good, but it's not necessarily a treatment. It's a change to that behavior. <clears throat> but the sting is in the tail. This could open up a number of new treatments individualized to the need of the patient. We don't need more treatments. There has been no major change in the way sleep apnea is diagnosed for 45 years. The techniques are not new. The drive to identify patients has steadily increased. There's no evidence. There's suggested relationships. There are no completed randomized controlled trials which effectively demonstrate that the treatment of OSA yields improved outcomes. And it goes on, my friends, it goes on. No new therapies have been introduced. Devices are smaller, quieter, better humidified. They deliver pressure in novel ways. Oh, maybe you're going to have, you know, a mask in your ear one of these days. But they do not function greatly differently from the 1980s. Masks are better. <clears throat> they may be responsible for modest gains. Appliances are proved. Then, of course, we come to these surgical procedures. And basically what he's saying is the only one that is relatively effective is double jaw surgery. There are new things on the market. It's always got to be things. It's provent, uh, exhalation back pressure. It's hypoglossal nerve stimulation. Companies going bankrupt. It's a, a, a negative airway pressure device. It's a keep pap, which is an on-demand device, still undergoing clinical trials. Surgically implantable devices, pharmacological approaches. None of these things work. This is all intervention. Remember what Maslow said. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And believe me, a lot of these nails are not appropriate. Many of them cause more damage than they do good. So the reality of the system, according to Keynes, is that wisdom teaches us it is better to fail conventionally than to succeed unconventionally. So we've come to the decade where we want to move on. Primary care physicians, 78% of them surveyed said they lack confidence in sleep. They have limited training. The courses are all intervention based. They understand the importance, but they have time constraints. They recommend sleep studies. There are conflicting outcomes. There's patient resistance. Where do people go for help? The answer is they come to a new specialty, and that is a specialty in functional airway management, and that cannot be done by the medical profession. Symptoms are not diseases. They're warning signs. Problems are seen as symptoms. They're not the same thing. The general medical model cannot do this. What's the point in having more and more and more ambulances at the bottom of the cliff? Just put a fence around the cliff and then you don't need the ambulances. It's time to look for alternatives. Comes the burning question, are dentists doctors? Well, of course they are doctors, but just not perceived as such for a very simple reason. Medicine is a serious business. Dentistry is just tooth mechanics, nice friendly place with high fives. How could you guys possibly know anything as serious as medicine? This drives me insane. And this is what has driven me to create this new specialty. But you're gonna to have to change your image. Perception is reality. If it looks like a dental office, Patient will expect to talk about teeth, change the environment, prompt questions, have concise information available, feature your practice as an integrative center, train and dress your team to be airway aware and not just dental. So we have a problem here, the human condition. 
we gravitate naturally to what we know best. The longer we're in practice doing the same things, the more difficult it becomes to change. Our DNA is tough, our dental DNA is even tougher, urging us to verge on the sides of caution. But it's time for a change. Life begins at the end of your comfort zone. It doesn't matter if you want to upset the status quo or upset set routines or uncertain or fear of criticism or fear of reaction or not knowing what to believe. Be concerned about what you are going to do. And as Einstein said, the thing that gets in the way of my learning is my education. We can change that. That is what this whole program is about. That is what the next eight months are going to be. An education into how we can look at things laterally. Dentists have it all. It's a team effort. You have the lot. You have the rooms. You have the space. For heaven's sake, you have the patient base. What percentage of dental patients actually have airway problems? Extraordinarily high. So this is now health care, not disease management. Friends, now is the opportunity to make a real, real difference. And according to Rabbi Hillel from 110 BC, if not you, who? If not now, when? Thank you. Bye, Danki. Siobonga. Nkosi. Kelaboga. Nzam. Nyehenza. So that's it. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen and then we can go into the questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Price. It was a very interesting session and definitely an awakening session in terms of how we look at patients and how we will treat patients um, now onwards. Um, I think it's definitely a, a section that we need to incorporate into our, our general education of dentistry. Um, there are a few questions and um, I'll run through them. Um, so we've, we've got some of them are comments and then some of them are, 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 are questions. So we've got a first okay. question. It says, why is health so fragmented that we blindly miss the obvious airway and sleep breathing issues? My local ENT even told a mother to find another dentist when I referred a child with a R-E-R-A, which I associate with a mouth breathing issue, which was worsening. Would you like to comment on that? It's very simple. It's not part of the training. So much is crammed into those four years that people come out trained in disease. They don't come out trained in health. Behavioral science, behavioral physiology, behavioral psychology is a four year intensive degree. Three years ago, I started doing a master's in this when I was in the US. It's a completely different world. It's a world of behavior. It's a world of survival. It's a world of taking the next breath so that we can survive. And the, the medical system is just not up to it. That's why we have to make a change. Thank you. So if I go to the next, the next uh, comment, there's a bit of a comment and a question in one. So all snorers are nocturnal bruxists, but all bruxists are not snorers. So believe we as dentists must be trained to screen for SPD as a routine. However, my problem is my local sleep clinic will not directly engage with me. How can we change the attitudes? Very simple. Stop talking about sleep. Talk about airway. Talk about breathing. Because the minute a dentist starts talking about sleep, the accusation is you're practicing medicine without a license. You're kind of trespassing on my turf. Let them have sleep. Let them have disease. Let them do all the things that they do for people who are already sick. We are looking for the cause. We're looking at posture. We're looking at breathing mechanics. 
We're not diagnosing, we're not prescribing. We're showing people what it is that they are doing that is exacerbating the problem. And I, I did this with a lot of practices in the US. They moved away from sleep. They took down the sign which says um, dental sleep medicine. Dental sleep medicine is three words that are totally meaningless. Airway has got nothing to do with dentistry. It has nothing to do with medicine. It's just that these words become overused and DSM and uh, uh, OSA and uh, CBT and all of these things, it's so much easier to toss them around than to think about them. Definitely. Oh, and to answer the question, bruxism is a sleep disorder. It is not a grinding jaw disorder. When you brux and when you clench, what you're doing is you're tightening the pharyngeal muscle walls and you're making that next breath a little easier. And snoring does not necessarily have anything to do with bruxism, even though the two are connected because snoring is a vibration. Snoring is a breathing dysfunction where you're moving too much air per breath, too many breaths per minute over these sensitive tissues, which then start vibrating. Not everybody moves too much air per breath, but they still brux and they still clench. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, then moving on to the next one, James Nestor in his recent book, The New Mind, Blowing Signs of Breathing, talks about actively doing breathing exercises daily, particularly breathing in and out of the nose as opposed to breathing out of the mouth. You have to hold your breath, breathing in and out. In this way, you teach your brain how to breathe. What do you think on that? Okay, I know James well. We met several years ago. We had a chat about his book and he laughed. He said, you know, everybody I talk about in my book was trained by you. <laughs> I've been around here a long, long time. You cannot find a simple answer to a complex question. Now, can you train your knee not to jump when it's hit with a rubber hammer? I don't like your chances. You cannot train a reflex. A reflex is outside of the cognition of the brain. Breathing is a reflex. You cannot retrain a reflex. What you can do is identify the obstacles that are getting in the way of that reflex functioning correctly. And that's what we talk about. So what James is talking about is changing a habit. It's changing a behavior. It's not like it's a cookie cutter exercise of you have to sit there and go in for four, out for three, hold for two, scratch your head, pick your nose, breathe in for four, out for three. You, you just don't do that because that does not suit everybody. It's far more complex than reading a book and saying, hold your breath. Definitely. I like that. Okay. I'll move on to the next one. Do you, <laughs> think, <laughs> do you think children that spend prolonged periods in front of the electronic PlayStations and other computer games compromise their normal physiological breathing patterns? A thousand percent, two thousand percent. Yes, 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 of course. What they are doing is changing their behavior. And remember that no habit is ever created without a payoff. And even if the payoff is a short-term negative, as it is with a compensation or a parafunction, that payoff is there to allow you to take the next breath. And the only way these kids can breathe when their heads are forward and their shoulders are rounded and there's all this pressure on the upper part of the body, the only way they can breathe is to open their mouths and use their chests. It's all a question of everything is interlinked. Life is all about survival. And survival is being able to take the next breath. And Vishal, if you don't take the next breath, it doesn't matter what's for breakfast tomorrow morning. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. 
Okay, the next one. You have the Mayo Brace emblem in the background. What, where does this appliance fit into your talk on breathing? I don't have a clue because I didn't do the background. <laughs> it was there. Okay, <clears throat> I know Mayo Brace very well. I've worked with Chris Farrell. I've worked with John Flutter. I've worked with Barry with all of these years. It's a positioning device. It's there to prompt change change of habit, to keep the lips together, to kind of get those, those emerging jaws that the, the, this mixed dentition and this eruption to happen more or less in the right place. It's not an answer, it's not a solution on its own. It has to be accompanied by other training. And that is why in the MyBase program, there's a degree of orofacial myology. There's a degree of breathing training. I mean, John Flutter did this. He and I were together for 10 years. And a lot of the stuff that we co-created found its way into the Maya Brace program. There is no one answer because there is no one problem. Right. I hope that answers the question for that person who asked the question. Yeah. The next is, will a bite plate assist with a patient's snoring? Short term, maybe. But if the snoring is because there's too much air moving in and out over those tissues, it's not. You put a piece of tape over your mouth, it'll stop the snoring coming out of your mouth, the snoring will come through your nose. We have to change the behavior pattern we have to make sure that the complex, the, the whole nasopharyngeal and the oropharyngeal complex, which is designed for no more than four or five liters of air per minute. We don't want to push 20 liters of air per minute through there. That is when you start getting your dysfunction, you start getting your mucosal inflammation, and you got to start getting your snoring. You've disappeared. Thank you. Are you there? Yes, I'm still here. Can yeah, you hear you've me? disappeared off my screen. I'm still Let me here. Go back to the meeting. Okay, Hello. I'm back. Right. You're back. All right, Joe. Hmm. Okay. The next, the next question is, uh, thank you, Mr. Price. That was an eye opener. What, in your opinion, is the usefulness of myofunctional therapy for improving OSAS? Wonderful. Not only was it an eye opener, it's a mouth opener as well. All right, that's the problem. <laughs> so the, the benefit of orofacial myology is that it helps to retrain the muscle pattern out of its dysfunctional position. When we talk about OSAS, this is like talking about flu. Anything is flu. A sore throat is flu. A runny nose is flu. Watery eyes are flu. No, flu is influenza, it kills people. Watering eyes don't kill people. But it's just too convenient to say this is OSA, this is flu, this is whatever it is. It's a question of stuff is out of balance. Anything that is going to help us get back to that homeostasis of the body, the, the homeostasis that the body enjoys, we will use that. I use postural therapy. I use a whole variety of things to get the body back into a functional norm. And the orofacial myology is very valuable, particularly when it comes to retraining and repositioning tongue. So yes, it is extremely valuable, but not on its own. It is not a cure in its own right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, there's another speak. Um, Another person who asked the question, they commended your session and they asking, is there a curriculum in place already for this course? Well, it's a difficult question to answer without being commercial. <laughs> yes, there is. <laughs> yeah, there is partially. It, it's a question, it's just developing now. But ultimately I'm going to join with a couple of colleagues and we're going to create this specialty functional airway. You will become a functional airway specialist. It doesn't exist. It doesn't mean we can't make one. 
definitely. Because After all, was there an implantologist before there was implantology? <laughs> True. Because there are there are a few there are few people that are asking about the similar question if there are courses or training available. So I thank you for that answer. Just moving on to the yes. next one. What do you think of the yogis teaching and practicing correct breathing called uh, pranayama? I think it's fabulous. Because if you have a look at your Eastern cultures, they're calm, they're gentle, they live a very long time, they they don't get sick, they don't have heart problems, they don't have diabetes, they're not obese. You know, there's a very interesting philosophy that when we're born, we're given a fixed number of breaths in our body. And when we die, we breathe our last breath. Well, the yogis are pretty smart mathematicians, you know. They divide the number of breaths by the number of breaths per minute and say, hey, guys, if we breathe more slowly, we've got a few more years ahead of us. And that is why so many of those who practice good breathing become elderly. The problem is that modern day yoga teachers, most of them don't have a clue. They do a three week course. They get some pretty cool looking tights where you're not quite sure what exercise to do. And then they say, breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth and alternate nostril breathing and uh, all kinds of things. And people do it for one hour. And then they go back to their horrible old habits and they think I'm doing yoga, I'm healthy. So much nonsense, so much, so much nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> and just personally speaking, I'm I'm quite impressed with your knowledge on on that on that area, and and you you said it spot on. Regarding well, yes, when you're that. 81 years old, you learn things. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I think we'll just do the last question. Um, yes. This this person is asking something based on COVID 19, and says, "What do you think of the following preventive strategy?" Number one, uh, using vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, and ivermectin for COVID-19. That's the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is uh, seven to eight hours of sleep daily, regular active breathing exercises, daily walking and physical exercises, no junk food and refined carbohydrate diet, and once a week dose of sleep hormone. I think you can comment generally on, on, on Okay, that. well, first of all, it's very difficult to comment on COVID-19 because we really don't know. We're busy finding things out all the time. Some things are working, some things are not working. In the areas of Africa, where malaria is, is a big thing, and people have been on anti-malarials or on anti-TB drugs in those countries where TB is a problem, it would appear that the statistics show that COVID-19 is not as dangerous when people are on these things, but it hasn't been around long enough to be able to research. You cannot do half an hour in 20 minutes. As much as you want to, you cannot hurry these things beyond their, their basic time frames. So I don't know. Yes, vitamin D3 is important. And by the way, at 81, I take no medications, not a single pill. But I do take 5,000 international units of D3 every day. And yes, I do have a good diet. And yes, I do sleep well. And yes, I walk eight to 10 kilometers every single day of my life. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, the old man creeps in and I, oh, I'm out of here. I'm, you know, it's overs, good overs with the whole thing. So the answer is, if your body is in balance, you stand a far greater chance than if you're chronically ill with comorbid diseases. In short, we don't know. Thank you so much. There's one more last question that I would, I think is, is rather interesting. Um, how important is posture in breathing? In, how important is posture in breathing, spinal posture, neck posture, and tongue posture? incredibly important because you have to understand that the core and the basis of breathing is nasodiaphragmatic. 
And the diaphragm is more than that stick face that kind of goes halfway across your body. The diaphragm massages the heart. It massages the lungs. The diaphragm drives lymph throughout your entire body to clear all the lymph nodes. The diaphragm changes the intrathoracic pressures, allowing the air to come in and to come out. And if your posture is compromised, your diaphragm doesn't work as well or as efficiently as it should. So the very first thing I do in every assessment, I do a detailed posture analysis. And in my training program, which is called Demystifying the Airway, I teach people how to do this. And I have a bunch of physios who are trained in something called connect therapy, which is teaching people how to lengthen the thorax and how to soften the intercostals and how to get the entire thoracic cavity and the thoracic spine mobilized so that you're breathing freely and the diaphragm is, is working freely. This upper chest and mouth breathing kills people. People die because of that. And you know something, Vishal? People think we're living longer. I don't think we're living longer. I think we're dying longer. It's not a happy thought to think about the last 10 years of most people's lives. So yes, posture is critical. Tongue posture is vital. Go back to Melvin Moss and his you know, his spatial matrix and his functional matrix hypothesis. The growth of the brain drives the skull. The growth of the eyes drives the orbits. The pressure of the tongue drives the alveolar ridge. It drives that maxilla forward. If there's no tongue pressure against the, 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 the maxilla, it does not grow forward. Then you get this ridiculous notion where the the septum is a cartilage that goes from the nasal bone to the maxilla. The nasal bone grows forward, the frontal bone grows forward, the maxilla sits back, and the septum goes kink. 90% of people have deviated septa because their maxillas have not grown in line with the frontal bone, keeping the septum straight. All of these things are connected. That's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> okay. you, that is very interesting. And I hope people took some good notes and pearls of wisdom. Um, lastly, but yeah. not least, um, can you recommend some further reading on this topic and subject? You know, at the risk of being terribly commercial, which I didn't intend doing, but I kind of got a message which said, talk about your course. I've written an e-course titled Demystifying the Airway. Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff tonight comes from that course. That course is online. It's quick. It's a very low cost program. It will teach you everything you need to know about what you have to learn and how you have to learn it. It's dead simple. It's the, the, the website is, uh, I think I put it up. I can put it up again when we finish. It's breathing-well.com. And you go there and there's a brochure which explains what the course covers. It's very low cost. It's 190 some US dollars. It's not these $5,000, $10,000 courses. And the idea is just so that before you make the decision to get into airway, find out what airway is. Airway is not a $6,000 weekend put on by the local Somnomed people to teach you how to make appliances. That's not airway. It's far more fundamental than that. End of commercial. We can now go back to other stuff, right? <laughs> but no. All right. No, thank you so much for the session. It was really wonderful and um, educational. I hope people really enjoyed the session and my apologies for the technical stuff i have no idea what went wrong it happens it's technology yeah. it right. does, ladies yeah. and gentlemen um on behalf of the team i would wish you a good night and keep well stay tuned for some of our um 
uh, more webinars during this month and um, best wishes. Good night and sleep well. <laughs> yeah, my Anki. My day is just starting. What are you talking about? The sun is coming up. You're Thank you so much, Michelle. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. And uh, it seems like um, um, Roger has rushed off to, to work. And uh, we say good night to everybody. I'm going to end the session just now. Thank you.